Okay. Um, have you started yet? I can start. Okay. Hi, Fred. Hey. hey. Hi, Alex. <laughs> it's been a while. Yes, yes. <laughs> I love your office. Oh, great. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, do, do you see the recording notification? I yes. do. Okay, great. All right, let's get started. Um, welcome to USF Transition Seminar, and this is Yu Zhang. I'm a professor in the uh, Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering, as well as a faculty of Qatar. And we're glad to have our one distinguished guest today, Professor Alexandra Bayer from UC Berkeley. And, you know, I know Alex when I was a PhD student at UC Berkeley when, you know, he joined UC Berkeley in 2005. So um, glad to have a couple of years overlap with him. And I think under his leadership, you know, um, in recent years, the, the ITS at UC Berkeley actually extended into many uh, frontier research areas. So, um, I will ask Dr. Shapen Lee from our side to give a formal introduction of um, Alex. So, Shapen. Uh, thank you, Yu Yu. Today, we are very honored to have uh, uh, Dr. Alex Bayan, the Liao Chao Professor of both Electrical Engineering and Computer Science and Civil Engineering, Civil and Environmental Engineering at UC Berkeley. Um, he is currently the director of the Institute of Transportation Studies and a faculty scientist in mechanical engineering at the Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory. Um, I just want to say something about uh, my respect to Dr. Bayan. And, uh, he has the unique uh, vision of identifying topics that uh, will become trending and hot. And that has been well materialized by activities of leading major piloting projects and uh, co-authoring highly cited papers. And his uh, research uh, covers a number of multidisciplinary areas ranging from general mobile sensing, uh, dynamic modeling of physical uh, matters and transportation systems, all the way to deep learning. Um, and he's a uh, role model of integrating fundamental research and technology transfer um, in a complete research and education process. And also, it is remarkable that his students can be found at many top universities across uh, various engineering departments. Um, and, and some of their work, including his work and students' work, also um, has inspired my research. So, um, without further ado, you know, I, I, I like to leave the time for Dr. Bayan, and I want to thank uh, him very much for his time and contribution for our webinar series. So, Alex, now the floor is yours. Thank you. Well, this is a really generous introduction, uh, Xiaopang. So, thank you so much. I'm really uh, honored to be giving the talk today and really excited uh, and um, humbled by uh, the introduction. And uh, I, I am usually really bad at predicting the future, but since you mentioned that, uh, if I had to bet for the next 10 years, I would say it's uh, um, urban uh, air travel, uh, which is not what I'm going to talk about today. Um, you, it's fantastic to see you uh, after so many years. Uh, and then Fred also, uh, it's been a while, so it's uh, nice to be amongst friends here. Um, so thank you again for the invitation. So today I'm going to talk about Lagrangian control at scale and local scales for mixed autonomy traffic flow. Uh, that's a topic I've been working on now for the last five years. Uh, and the main motivation for this was when I was appointed at the Lawrence uh, National, uh, the Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. Um, at the time, the US Department of Energy was just starting a program called SMART, uh, inspired strongly by the work of uh, Don McKinsey um, at UW and co-authors in which they had done uh, some form of a back of envelope computations to demonstrate that uh, in the world of automation, the footprint, the energy footprint of automation could lead to 60% improvement in fuel consumption. And that's kind of a, you know, ideal situation where you platoon and, and, and you manage demand well, uh, to a worsening of the energy footprint of uh, uh, congestion by 200%. And that's maybe a situation where there's a bunch of empty cars uh, on the freeways, clogging the freeway, picking up children, 
at school or cars just circling around in the city without parking. And that was a big motivation for the US Department of Energy at the time. And so that's when they started investing in uh, understanding how we could make a world in which automation was becoming more and more prevalent, uh, a world in which that would also lead to a better energy footprint of, of mobility. Um, and so we came into that uh, story at a time when micro simulation and make the assumption that most of the people today understand the difference between micro simulation, micro simulation, meso simulation. But it was a time when micro simulation, so the ability to um, model uh, individual car trajectories uh, pretty accurately, uh, was becoming scalable. When when you as a student at Berkeley and I joined at Berkeley, if you had told people that you're going to run a micro simulation of the city of Berkeley, people would have looked to you and say you're crazy. Um, but if you make that same statement today, uh, people will look at you and say, well, if you're Google or if you're um, AWS and you have enough cloud computing, uh, provided you have the data to calibrate the model, it's not crazy that you could do it. And that's the beginning of our work. Um, and so uh, so the, the thing is, if you look at the state of the art in micro simulation today, uh, there's a few uh, dominating players. Uh, so there's uh, Imson Online and PTV. So Siemens and, 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 and PTV are the two major companies for the private sector. And then Sumo is kind of a counterpart to that uh, in the open source uh, domain. Um, and so that's where we came in. We figured, well, could we be among the first groups to interface and integrate uh, state-of-the-art deep reinforcement learning libraries with a cloud implementation of a microsim, which five years ago really did not exist. And you might remember five years ago, uh, Imsun was not even running on the cloud. In fact, this project was the first project for which uh, uh, built of Imsun that was working on AWS was used. And so if you think about the future, since we're talking prediction of the future, um, data, we make the assumption will be available. Doesn't mean you get it, doesn't mean I get it, but someone will get it. Google, Apple, AWS, Uber, there'll be enough data to, to calibrate these models. Um, calibration is very hard uh, because you need a good demand model and a good routing model. So that's stuff that's not closed. There's still a lot of open research and challenges. Uh, computational cost is also a big challenge, so it, we're not done there. Uh, and I think this is just the beginning of control and optimization uh, on these models. And so the red stuff here is essentially what we um, what we uh, um, are focused on. And so you can see I'm a Star Wars guy. Um, but um, what we essentially undertook about two years ago, uh, so it's like a two years action plan was, could we use that state of the art micro sim? Could we use state of the art RL uh, libraries? and use that in a uh, AWS framework where we could demonstrate the ability to uh, do traffic control. And most specifically, the opportunity we saw there was mobile traffic control, which is using self-driving vehicles to control traffic. So if we do a leap in history, uh, anybody who has been at Berkeley knows that picture because that's what you see in traffic flow class. That's the first recording of the fundamental diagram by a uh, name, uh, person named Bruce Greenshield in 1935 uh, in Ohio. Um, and that was the first known model, at least in recording history, of, of, of traffic flow. Uh, about 20 years later, the first uh, traffic flow model uh, as a dynamic PD was um, uh, uh, invented by Lightheel, Wetham and Richards. Um, and then if you fast forward about a half a century, um, this experiment was performed by Sugiyama in Japan about uh, 13 years ago. And this experiment is world famous. It, it's a big hit on YouTube, but it's really famous because it's simple. You ask people to drive next to each other at a given speed um, and maintain their distance. And what you see in that video is that essentially um, there is uh, immediately a form of congestion that appears, which is not demand induced, but just induced by the fact that humans are not good at that kind of regulation. These traffic waves are called phantom jams or jamitons. Uh, they have all kinds of weird names. Um, and uh, these waves are responsible for a lot of inefficiency in traffic. I'm sure all of you have experienced this once upon a time on the freeway. Uh, and also very bad for safety just because a lot of uh, accidents happen. Now, fast forward 10 years, um, former grad student of the program around the time you was at Berkeley, Dan Work and three other colleagues uh, performed that experiment in Arizona where they took a self-driving vehicle, which is indicated here by this black arrow here, you can see it here. Right now it's driven by a human. 
um, and inserted it in that same ring. So right now, the car has not turned on the automation. And because of human inabilities to regulate, you can see these traffic waves happening again. And right now, it just turned on uh, flow smoother. And what you see happening is the waves pretty quickly die down. This was revolutionary because uh, when they did that experiment, they demonstrated from the CAN bus OBD2 port by measuring the fuel consumptions of the vehicle that they could reduce the energy consumption of that traffic by 42% with one vehicle. That's crazy, 42%. Um, and that was a real breakthrough in the, in the field of mixed autonomy because this is one of the few cases where you can demonstrate that you can actually use uh, mixed autonomy to make traffic better. And, and it's not reducing congestion. That's not the problem. The problem is really reducing the energy footprint of congestion, which is a different uh, problem. It's not demand management. Now, one year later, Kathy Wu, another grad from the group who is now a professor at MIT, um, did the following experiment in simulation using uh, reinforcement learning. So she did uh, the same setting where um, Essentially, you have a vehicle that is automated. That's the uh, red vehicle. Uh, you, it, the only thing it can see is this blue vehicle. And any white vehicle, it doesn't know it's there. It can sense it through the blue, but it doesn't know. And so any other vehicle is an IDM or CFM or you name it. You take your favorite model. And what you see is that when it turns on the autopilot, which it just did, it's able to also stabilize the ring. That numerical experiment was done in Sumo in 2018 one year after the test. Now, you're probably wondering, well, Alex, if there was a real test with real vehicle in 2017, why did Kathy do that thing in 2018? And the reason is that this, what you're watching now, does not use a model of the white vehicles or the blue vehicles to perform the same smoothing. And that's radical in that the previous video I showed, there's a follower stopper model. So there's a model of the ring, there's a model of the instability, and that's how you construct the controller. What you, what you just did watch now in simulation, the way it's computed, and I'm going to explain that in the rest of the talk, is it does a simulation, it computes a score, and based on reinforcement learning, it keeps improving the score until it does it, but it does not assume that the red vehicle has knowledge of the dynamics of the blue vehicle or the white vehicle. So you could view this as a model-free algorithm in that, yes, there is a model to compute the score, that's SUMO, but the controller does not have knowledge of that model. Um, and so the crazy thing is that if you look at the production of articles, between 1935 and 2008, there's probably over 10,000 articles on traffic flow theory. Uh, then 2008 came and this Phantom Jam video appeared. Everybody started to be really excited about it. So you could probably count around 10, well, around 1,000 articles on traffic on instabilities, traffic flow instabilities, how to shave jammy tons and blah, blah, blah. Uh, leading to finally them uh, coming up with that control algorithm to stop the waves. And then with one article, Kathy managed to redo the same without the models. And that's kind of, disru that's kind of disruptive in a sense uh, because what it says is that as long as you can simulate a system well, maybe you do not need all this analytical work to uh, perform control. And that's an extremist statement. The truth is it'll be in the middle. But it, it, when we saw that, that got us really thinking about what we could do with it. And so um, then we came up with a way to try to generalize this. And so every movie I'm going to show now is going to have the same color code. A red vehicle is a self-driving vehicle. A blue vehicle is a vehicle that is not self-driving, but that can be sensed by the red vehicle. So for example, that vehicle here, they can sense the guy in front, they can send the guy in the back. And then a white vehicle is a vehicle that is just on the road, but you can't sense it, you don't know it's there. You might be able to observe it indirectly through another vehicle, but you, you, don't, you, don't, you can't do anything about it. So if you apply the exact same algorithm and try to stabilize a double ring, that's what happens. So it's kind of a pretty intuitive what the self-driving vehicle is doing. It's essentially behaving like a jerk, like a total jerk, because what it's doing is it's essentially switching like back and forth to prevent people in the back from passing it. And the same algorithm manages to stabilize that double ring. Um, now, you could argue that's pretty intuitive because that's what uh, you learn to do in police academy. Uh, in French, it's called a snail operation. You use that to slow down the freeways. So interesting that the algorithm rediscovered that. Now, if you think about intersections, um, this is the most inefficient way of managing an intersection. Every car stops and the priority goes to the car next. 
Uh, so it's very bad because throughput is low and it's very bad because lots of acceleration. If you launch the algorithm on that same setting, what you see happening is that it will actually create a snake of the exact length that you can never stop. So essentially it's like a platoon. So it's interesting because it means the reinforcement learning essentially indirectly learned the intervehicular distance that results from the car following model, even though it does not have a model of it, and it selects the speed that will achieve it. Um, so it's an interesting emerging behavior where it has essentially rediscovered platooning. If you like uh, time space diagrams, essentially it transforms this thing where cars cross each other into this things where car platoon uh, to each other. Uh, another example here is now take that merge um, where essentially the same politeness uh, approach leads to pretty inefficient uh, throughput. Uh, now what it's doing, well, I can't really tell you what it's doing. In fact, you could try to look for yourself. It's stopping for now. Then it kind of released, so it kind of played the little metering light role for a while um, while the queue clears. And then again, it'll stop vehicle. So it's, I, I could try to invent a story, but the truth is I do not have a story. And the reason is the RL somehow found something somewhat counterintuitive or intuitive, but um, it's, it's, there's no physical intuition behind it. And that's kind of what got us interested in this too, because I think we figured maybe um, this is a case where machine learning can, in a sense, uh, supersede the human intelligence in discovering policies, uh, so control algorithms that uh, we couldn't think about uh, heuristically. Uh, so another thing we did then was trying to see if we could use transfer learning. And the transfer learning process is a process by which you learn in a certain setting, uh, and then you use the policy on a different setting. So the idea is, could you use what you've learned on the ring to demonstrate something on the merge? Um, so the merge uh, problem is a typical wave generation problem where, you know, if you inject cars into that uh, junction here, it will create waves that propagate backwards. It's probably not easy to see over Zoom, but what you should see now is a higher concentration of cars here, and that's propagating backwards uh, to progressively clog uh, the upstream of the flow uh, through these back propagating waves. Now, if you take a car that has been trained in the ring, and you keep perturbing the system in that way, you should look at the red cars here and what they do more specifically. Look at the red car, it's slowing down, and then looks at the next red car, it's stopped, if you look where my mouth, my mouse is. And it starts to re-accelerate so it can rejoin the thing at the junction. And same, that one slows down and then rejoins the junction. And this one stops again and holds the cars until the junction. So essentially, it's as if you had taught a self-driving car on the ring to be a traffic light, a red traffic light. Um, and it does exactly what it should be doing, because if you look at the time-space diagram for this, what happens at the merge is every time you add a car right here, if you look at my mouse, that car addition creates a back-propagating wave, and that's the wave. But if you have learned on the ring that you should preemptively slow down because you can see the car in front of you, it's really far, and you have that knowledge, essentially what you do is you slow down preventively, so at the time you reconnect with the uh, junction point, the mini queue that has created due to the merge has dissipated. And again, I'm narrating this to you, but the point is you do not need a model for this. It's something that it learned in a setting and is applying in a different setting. Um, so the two PhD students um, uh, who uh, did that, uh, Abu Dikraidye and Eugene Venitsky, um, then started to be interested in uh, understanding, well, if you put enough of these, could that be enough to smooth traffic? And we did some penetration rate studies where you, you know, if you have none of them, you have these waves, and if you add 10%, then essentially you can smooth that lane. That was actually picked by Science Magazine at the time. Um, and that was for us a starting point of the work we're currently doing with the US Department of Energy. What you see on these two picture videos here is essentially a rendering of cell of um, uh, places which have these phantom jams or these self-driving um, or, or these um, uh, jamitons. So you can see there's like uh, the, the, where the demand is not oversaturated. So in a sense, there's no reason for this to happen. But nevertheless, you see this happening because of traffic instability. Um, so this became our first goal. Um, we figured we've done the lab experiment. That's the ring. 
uh, let's try to see if we can do something on a real freeway, which is what we're doing here. So we first started this in simulation. And so that's the model we were using at the time. That's the I-210 connected corridors model that was developed uh, by PATH here at Berkeley for District 7 of the California Department of Transportation. Uh, and uh, with that, we started uh, seeing how we could apply it. So what you see here is uh, in the um, eastbound of 210, I'm going to stop to pause uh, vehicles right now it's pretty light traffic and then once in a while there's a self-driving vehicle in red right now there's no waves and the uh, self-driving vehicle are just driving by humans so that there's no algorithms moving um, as traffic progresses you can see on the bottom right corner that now traffic has become pretty heavy um, and so if i pause again you'll see there's still a certain penetration of self-driving vehicles um, but the traffic around it has gotten pretty heavy and it's hard to see through Zoom, but there's essentially waves going back and forth uh, in this movie, uh, which is the traffic instabilities happening. And the traffic instabilities start to happen at a certain uh, density and frequency. Uh, and now what you're going to see in about 10 seconds is um, blue cars will appear. And that means essentially the red cars have turned on the autopilot and are starting to do the flow smoothing. So when that happens, then it's just happened now. You can see some blue cars. So now that means the autopilot can sense the car in the front. That's all it can sense. So it can, this guy can sense this guy, this guy can sense this guy, and so on and so forth. And now it's applying a, a fully decentralized policy to smooth the traffic. Um, if I keep the movie playing long enough, you'll see that after a while, it has smoothed the traffic. And even though VMT has not changed much, TTT has not changed much, so throughput has not changed much. Um, there's no more waves. And that's the point I'm always making when I try to present these results is we're not removing congestion. That's not the same problem. We can't do that. Um, what we're doing is once demand is on the freeway, we smooth it in a way that we remove the waves, which we believe uh, can provide a lot of energy improvement uh, to traffic. So this is kind of summarized here by this uh, graph. Uh, without a control policy, you have these waves. Um, this is an example on I-24 in Tennessee. Um, and with the policy, um, you essentially remove, you don't fully remove the waves because it's pretty hard, but you remove enough of the waves that the energy improvement is significant. So the idea would be, okay, could we do this at scale? Could we do this with infrastructure? And ultimately, can we do it on an ongoing basis? Um, so for that, essentially what it amounts to is to consider a reward function for the RL algorithm that corresponds to some form of negative of the energy consumed. It's a bit more complicated because the optimal solution to that is you stop everybody on the freeway and you freeze. So there needs to be a little bit more, but that's kind of intuitively what the algorithms use. Um, you could see how that become helpful for more uh, interesting and complex scenarios too, because for example, if you try to do distributed bridge metering, um, you know, the problem in San Francisco is that the bridge clogs really quickly. Uh, but if you preemptively use this as a form of, of pacifier of the inlet, you could actually maintain the capacity of a bottleneck much longer. And so there is another use of that that uh, could be interesting. You know, the Bay Bridge has a metering light, so it's not really something that uh, is needed here. But a lot of bridges do not have metering lights. And that is an example of uh, uh, you know, um, flow smoothing that could be used here. This is the example of the Bibridge model also run in uh, Sumo. Um, so then we decided, okay, now we need to demonstrate this in hardware. Uh, so we did a collaboration that was done by Kathy Jang, who is a current PhD student here at Berkeley, uh, together with a team of Andreas Malikopoulos at uh, University of Delaware. Um, and so here's an example of, uh, so every vehicle you'll see in this mini city um, movie Every time the blue vehicle is essentially a self-driving vehicle, so it's, it's running the algorithm, and the other vehicles are essentially just regular driven vehicles, so your typical car following model or something. And what you watch is like in the baseline scenario, essentially the blue vehicles have somehow paced the overall flow in a way that on the right where they're applying the RL, um, they've maximized the throughput of the roundabout. You can watch the Hummer vehicle here is the last to exit uh, the roundabout, it's doing it about now, but on the left where there's no control, essentially there's still vehicle there. So an example of a transfer learning case where um, we learned this in simulation, 
we demonstrated its validity in simulation and we transferred it to the hardware and demonstrated that it worked right in the hardware. Now, this is not a real vehicle, obviously, but this was a first step towards hardware. Um, this is another example of flow smoothing. This was this is Eugene and Fang Yu Wu, another student of the group. Um, and this was uh, at the CPS meeting right before the pandemics. And this was the last uh, uh, example of flow smoothing we did uh, on the, with a different robotics platform. Now, there's another, another interesting outlook here is that you know, if you think about the um, uh, reinforcement learning loop, essentially what it does is it uh, has a simulation environment and that Sumo, Emson, it's like the expert um, built environment. And that environment provides a reward. For example, how many joules have you burned? How many miles, uh, per, uh, how many miles per gallon have you optimized? Or how many gallons of gas has the uh, energy model burned? Now that reward is computed from the state. Uh, and the state means essentially in the simulation, you have access to every vehicle data and trajectory. Uh, so you know exactly what vehicles have done. You know exactly how much gas they've burned. Based on that, the agent uh, comes up with the next action. Now, the question is, uh, you know, that's already a leap in that if you think about the last century of uh, traffic flow modeling, anything from LWR models or um, you know, um, it makes assumptions that you have access to the state. What's different is we don't see how the state evolves. We we consider this as a black box, but we still have access to it. Now, what if instead of having access to it, we only had access to a rendering of it, a picture of it? So something that would look like this. So this is still the map of Mini City in uh, Delaware. So what if we didn't know this car is going 20 miles an hour, uh, it's burned that many joules. Um, what if we only saw a picture of that car doing whatever it's doing and got the result of how many joules it burned? So think about this as replacing your sensing by access to vehicle diagnostics and parameters to essentially accessing to a picture or a movie of what's happening. What's amazing is that with a little bit of modification of the reward, you can actually still control traffic by looking at traffic. So now it's not only that you don't need a model anymore, but you don't need to access this full state space. You just look at it and assume that you have the score. And what we demonstrated then is that in the case of Minnesota and in some of the canonical cases, we were able to reproduce the um, essentially performance of the algorithms we had before with almost one to one match by by just looking at it and seeing uh, what it's doing. So essentially learning from the pixels what it's doing rather than learning from the model of the vehicle. Uh, and it's interesting because you can do this in a centralized fashion, that would be the left movie. So it's as if like you're looking at the whole city and optimizing, but down the road, you can also do this in a decentralized sensing and decentralized fashion where you only make the assumption you know what's happening in the vehicle, which is the right movie here with the four little circles. And the reason why that's important is that think 10 years from now or 20 years from now, um, segmentation and online uh, cameras, which are already prevalent in most level uh, one, two, three, four, five automation vehicles we have, is going to probably come on board every vehicle. So by that time, information such as the one you see here will be available in each of the vehicles. And if you had access to a subset of these, technically you could be able to control traffic from rendering from video without it in accessing to the onboard um, diagnostics and the onboard canvas. And so I think that will provide the one of the milestones and, 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 and bricks for uh, distributed mobile control, which is, I think, the way, you know, freeways and in general urban traffic will probably be managed 10 years from now or 20 years from now or 30 years from now. It's not happening tomorrow, but this is happening in a few decades. So the, I guess the, the if fun part here is that uh, for those of you who followed the you know, work of uh, Google DeepMind in Q-Learning about uh, eight or nine years ago now, uh, and for those of you who are old like my generation who played Atari games in the 70s, you might remember the game of Pong. And uh, so the game of Pong that you see on the left movie here um, is essentially a game in which you pick, you, you try to break the wall by having the ball break the bricks uh, and, um, uh, and, and dig holes here. Uh, if, you, if you ever played that game in the 70s, you know it's a pretty difficult game because you have to uh, place your board well. Um, 
And you might also remember that there are tricks to do the job easier in which you dig a hole and you let the ball get stuck behind it. So this is an example of how Q-learning was used by Google to solve that problem, but without the model of uh, the ball. So when I was trained as a control theorist, my approach would have been like every control theorist approach. You make a model of the trajectory of the ball, of how it uh, bounds on the walls, and then you did drive your optimal controller. But Q-learning, as was implemented by Google, essentially just looks at the pixels, collects the score, and learns how to play by watching how it plays. No model um, or no physical model. Uh, there's another example of application of Q-learning was the game of Go, where essentially the world champion was beaten by um, uh, the same or similar algorithm. And so, you know, so, you know, video games and Go is like specific uh, things which are pretty simple. But the notion that traffic flow control could ultimately be solved that way is not science fiction. I think it's something we will see in our lifespan. And so I think this application of deep learning is, is very promising in our mind because we believe that it, it will really be um, uh, opening a lot of different avenues that classical control theory and in, your, in general classical control might not necessarily solve. I mean, all of you who have worked on lane change problems know it's hard. It's hard because it explodes combinatorially. It's hard because you need to have a model. Um, but if you just had good rendering and good data, maybe the algorithms could help you deal with it. Um, so this was kind of the premise of how we built Flow. Essentially, Flow was the first historical integration of deep reinforcement learning libraries um, on AWS, able to query two microsimulators. We started with Imson and then moved to Sumo. Uh, and this was the first time Imson ever run, uh, run on the cl cloud. In fact, Siemens, or by then uh, Imson, built a special uh, uh, version of Imson for us so we could run it on the cl cloud for this project. And of course, now it's become part of their offerings. Um, so I guess the approach is you have a bunch of legal blocks and you do it more and more complex because you can't just do everything. Uh, you can just do it like uh, on demand. It's we're not there yet, but but we're getting there. Um, I'm going to skip this for now. Um, but what we're building now for our project with the DOE is essentially a pipeline so that now we can use this framework to start ranking algorithms on the leaderboard. So say there's a specific case you're interested in and three groups in this audience are interested in three different algorithms, we can run these algorithms through the pipeline and essentially compare them on the leaderboard. Uh, that's what the leaderboard looks like. So you can see there's a window here and that window, uh, the horizontal axis represents the times the algorithms are checking and then the vertical axis is the score of the algorithms. And so you can see how the score um, is improving over time as people are checking in more algorithms. Uh, we've run some workshops and uh, hopefully after the pandemics we'll start again. I mean, I think now we're a bit paused on this. Um, and then open essentially now the, the work to the a much bigger team is working together. So this is the team of circles. Um, so until now, I mostly spoke about flow, which is that framework. And for the last couple minutes of this talk, I'll talk about circles, which is um, essentially our go to practice approach. Um, you can recognize five of the faculty, uh, you know, that are pretty visible in the community: Benedetto Piccoli in math, uh, uh, Benny Siebold um, uh, at Temple, also math, Dan Work who is at Vanderbilt, John just moved at Vanderbilt, and Johnny Lee uh, worked at Uber for many years before he joined our team. And we're working very closely with uh, Toyota, Nissan, and GM, um, as well as the Tennessee Department of Transportation. And so the goal here is, um, for those of you who have been uh, in Nashville recently, you'll know that the I-24 is undergoing massive instrumentation. Um, so essentially, the Tennessee Department of Transportation is deploying one gigantic pole um, like this one uh, every 500 meters. And a pole has these uh, very high resolution video cameras um, that uh, uh, six pack that can give us a complete view of the field. Um, and so. In a sense, this is something which is probably going to be one million times bigger than the NGSIM data. Most of you probably remember the NGSIM data we collected at Berkeley over 20 years ago. This is probably one million times bigger. We can't even store the data uh, more than a few days before we have to delete the data, and that will be the input essentially to our system. So we did our first experiment uh, this summer where we did a first test with about 10 cars. You can see these are RAV4s in the back. Uh, so it's kind of a bit of a reminiscent thing of what we did 12 years ago at uh, at Berkeley when we ran the mobile century, but this is for now much smaller. Uh, so we had a command center uh, on the parking lot and essentially every morning at uh, uh, 630 we would launch the cars 
uh, with help of the police onto the freeway and essentially so you can see the cars getting onto the freeway um, and then once they were on the freeway just stabilize on lane number two uh, and start smoothing traffic while the rest of the team was um, monitoring what was happening um, and so this is an ex this is what the team was uh, was doing at the time and uh, this is the first time we essentially try this flow smoother on the real freeway and um, a lot of things happen that we did not expect for example um, people on I-24 drive sometimes very aggressively, so lane changes um, reduce the headway abruptly without any warning. And that's something our algorithms were not trained for, um, for a variety of reasons, and one of them being that uh, lane switch models in simulations are difficult. Uh, so things we'll be doing in the future is understanding of how gathering such data on the freeway will enable us to, um, um, to uh, essentially handle these lane switches better. Um, so on the day of the experiment, which we're going to keep running over the next year to come uh, to ramp up the number of vehicles for next year, uh, the, the experiments are always the same. Essentially, there's a leader vehicle, uh, so we can measure some reference trajectory. Then there's a bunch of people who just happen to be on that freeway at that time, and then there's a flow smoother. So the flow smoother essentially manages the abrupt accelerations of the car right behind, behind in front of it, and then hopefully in that process smoothes the vehicles that are behind it. So it's like. Um, instead of accelerating to catch up as much as possible, it, it does that local smoothing uh, that propagates through the vehicles, which are not our vehicles. And then we have a vehicle that senses this just to see if we can uh, measure how much improvement we have done. And then we do this as a big string of vehicles. So you can see um, how it works. And the idea is that we would like to build something that ultimately leads to maybe two, three, four, five percent penetration rate at some point when we run bigger tests to demonstrate that that can run at scale and that maybe if 5% of the vehicle could do it, then it would provide great improvements. Um, and 5% is not science fiction, because if you go to some places in the Bay Area, uh, there are places where there's over 5% of the vehicles are Teslas. And implementing this algorithm on a Tesla is just a software push. So it's not difficult. Uh, whether they do it, whether there's an incentive for it, whether it would work, complete different story. But technologically, it's, it's, it could be done today. So these are different scenarios we run, and these are these are uh, examples of uh, of trajectories we collected. And you can see these waves happening here. And essentially, if you look a bit more precisely, you'll see the trajectories have jumps, and the jumps correspond to headway. So when the headway uh, jumps up, that means the car in front of you left the lane, and when the when the headway went abruptly down, that means someone just went into your lane really fast and cut in front of you. And these are things that our algorithms currently cannot handle. So the next generation algorithms we're going to deploy in our next batch of tests will essentially be able to do that. And you can see it can, it can be very scary because you're, you're in a self-driving vehicle now. Uh, it's, it's doing longitudinal control. Um, and abruptly now it's, it's going to break really hard because of someone cutting in front of you. And, and that's, that's, that's pretty stressful. So these are the trajectories that we've, uh, we've collected. I'm just going to um, skip that. Um, and essentially our objective for next year in addition to continuing this test in Nashville, is we're also going to start a partnership with Nissan. Uh, so the Nissan lab in Sunnyvale uh, has a lot of vehicles we can use here. Uh, and together in partnership with the city of Danville, we'll um, deploy these to see if we could uh, smooth the traffic there. There's a recurring bottleneck uh, that is uh, of concern. And so it'd be interesting to see um, if we could, for example, reduce local emissions by just uh, uh, doing that smoothing. And ultimately, I think maybe there will be also the aspiration that this could become a living lab. So if you're interested in uh, in this work, um, we have a website where you can download the software. It's uh, open source, um, so you can go and download it. Um, if you're interested in uh, mixed autonomy traffic, we also have a website for the Circles project. Now, Flow is Berkeley uh, and MIT. I mean, uh, there's a branch that Kathy Wu is now developing there. Um, um, and uh, Circles is this consortium, and ultimately our consortium will grow, so there might be also opportunity to do things in Florida. Uh, right now, we're just very focused on delivering things in Nashville and in, in California, but down the road, it could grow. Um, and uh, with that, I'm going to stop, and um, I'd be happy to answer any questions. So again, I want to thank uh, you and uh, Xiaopeng for uh, for the invitation. I'm, I'm, uh, I wish I could be there in person, because uh, judging on your background, you have really good weather. Um, and uh, uh, thank you again. Thanks a lot for this presentation. It's open eyes. Um, we do have, okay, so let me mention this. This seminar actually is a hybrid, which means we have a lot of the uh, attendees online, but we also have a students 
in the cut building 202. So uh, in the meeting chat, I mentioned, you know, you are more than welcome to unmute yourself and ask a question, or you can put your question in the meeting chat, okay? And um, so the first question from the audience is that, um, actually come from Ken Sides, and he asked, um, could the delivery and other autonomous cargo vehicles do double duty as smoothing AVs or pace cars? Even during a transition period when AV cargo vehicles still have human drivers, they could serve as traffic smoothing AVs. Could you comment on this? Yes, thank you for the question. Um, if I understand correctly, the question is how specific types of fleet vehicle, for example, cargo um, carrying or, uh, or delivery vehicles could be used as flow smoothers. Um, yeah, the answer is uh, absolutely yes. Um, in fact, if I mean, if one thinks about um, if, if you've been on the California freeway with a lot of trucks, uh, you can see that trucks are flow smoothers by nature because of their heavy dynamics and um, inability to accelerate fast or uh, and reluctance to decelerate uh, abruptly. Um, so uh, using that is actually a really good idea. Um, and the notion that um, uh, uh, a fleet could participate, I think, has a lot of advantages. The first one is it's better for the fleet because it's also a form of eco-driving in that they burn less energy, so they benefit directly. The second is that you could see a partnership with the states. For example, you might remember in 2006, um, when the Prius Generation 1 came, um, that gave you access, if you had such a vehicle, to the diamond lane. Why? Because California was trying to push electrification. So there could be a similar thing where if you have a vehicle that qualifies, say you're Amazon and you have a delivery van uh, or you're a truck operator and you have trucks that can do that, um, if you deployed that technology, I mean, the technology is not here yet, right? We're still in the lab, but say 10 years from now, five years from now, the technology is here, um, you could get a rebate for that or you could get some benefit for that or special access to special uh, uh, facilities for that, um, which would be a good way for the states to incentivize uh, this. So I think the notion of using a fleet is really great. Um, in fact, um, th another benefit is that usually fleets have all similar vehicles. Like if you're Amazon, you have like three or four types of vans. Um, uh, this complicated because they also have Amazon Flex, but leaving that for aside. So there's also the nice aspect that it's easier to run on the similar type of vehicles. Um, so I, I believe that's really one way to scale this up. Um, my hope is that uh, ultimately in 10 or 15 years, when every car comes with ACC, that could just be a different setting in ACC, uh, like flow smoothing. Um, but of course, society has to learn um, to handle this. It's not it's not intuitive. It's not doing what the human would like to do, which is to catch up with a vehicle in front. So I think there is a little bit of a learning curve here. And therefore, fleets, I think, like the Ken you mentioned, I, I think is something that is a, a definitely interesting and a promising uh, next step for us. So to follow up the, the what you have mentioned, it looks like you're talking about, you know, uh, in the future, it could be switched between different modes, right? It, mode, it could be like the, the, the modes of smoothing the traffic and become a tool in the flow, or you can just put whatever autopilot of that vehicle. And then maybe, you know, to incentivize that by providing some, uh, uh, um, you know, financial, kind of incentive from the government. Um, now, the I think for the for the existing, uh, when we talk about that very initial stage, uh, it's possibly that there will be a human control versus autopilot. So they could have a switch between these two modes. And intuitively, when people are in the congested um, condition, probably they want to control the vehicle by themselves instead of switch to autopilot. Um, concerning about the, the safety issue. So um, in the, at the early stage, we're talking about maybe 5% of the vehicle will be enough to smooth the traffic. But when we consider cognitive concerns of the, 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 the human being, so how you can, is there any way that we can encourage people doing so? Uh, th thank you, that's a very rich question. 
that's a very rich question that touches on three many many things but three i noted um safety comfort and cognitive so start with cognitive um a human will try to do the opposite of the algorithm by nature most of the humans will try to catch up with the vehicle in front so the the human will augment the instability that's just human nature um so if, if you want to use the human as a flow smoother essentially you have to teach the human to not do what it wants to do uh in fact dan work and uh, john sprinkle created something called can coach which is a way to do that so it's a very simple thing that you add to acc where if you go too fast it beeps and if you go too slow it also beeps so it kind of teaches you how to do to flow to smooth traffic um but that's really making the assumption that people will do the right thing for society and um i, I think uh it's a very idealistic world view of the future uh and it's also assuming that people will become good at doing what is counterintuitive to them which is also a big uh, issue so um that's why in general um you know when we when we when we started this we even thought um i mean at the time i was working at uber uh and why not hire uber drivers to do that you could give them better ratings if they did that and so on and so forth but the truth is you're just asking to do something to a human who does not want to do it so the second part is comfort now, for those of you who drive stick shift, you know that if you're stuck in traffic with stick shift, it really sucks. Um, and uh, in a sense, having a, a no stick shift uh, automatic uh, driving is already a, such a great relief. Um, I've driven all my life in Paris and driving in Paris with stick shift is not fun. Um, so in many ways, if this became something that happens by default in traffic, you might even make it easier for people um to go through traffic because now okay they're going to just have some uh, traffic congestion acc we, let's call it this way um it makes their life more comfortable but then it goes to the third point you mentioned you which is okay what about safety because to do this you need to know that people will be comfortable enough to do it that they don't feel oh my god this is so stressful and so in a sense um the comfort needs to be um uh, in a sense comforted by safety and the feeling of safety and we're not there yet actually when we run the test last summer or this summer in nashville i mean this was very stressful we had a driver who was essentially there pushing on the autopilot and we had a assistant with the radio next to the driver just to help if anything happens so there is still a huge leap before this becomes mature enough that people feel safe and bottom line that it becomes safe period and we've known from the tesla accidents the uber accidents that um you know there's still a lot of uh, work to do before we're there so it's not gonna happen tomorrow sure sure thank you so much i saw fred raised your hand fred do you want to ask a question uh yes i have um uh one observation maybe get your comment we know that in recent years, cars have become much faster. You know, the zero to 60 times have dropped and the braking has improved. But, you know, your comment about truck smoothing traffic, you could argue that people's demand for uh, speed has actually exaggerated the oscillations and made it worse over time. Um, that would be sort of a fascinating, you know, to, if you look at the where cars were perhaps the worst it was in the 1980s when they had all the pollution equipment they all accelerated very slowly uh, it would be fascinating to look at how the performance characteristics of the vehicle uh, affect the oscillations because really if you look at teslas i mean they have amazing acceleration right and if they're under human power then the aspect you know the possibility of an um, enormous oscillations could occur you know so that we're sort of fighting, we have two technologies, you know, we have the calming technologies and then we're developing vehicles that will feed the human tendency, um, you know, to oscillate. So that's, yeah, just your uh, truck comment sort of brought that to mind. It's interesting, you're, so it's so true. I mean, like, uh, yeah, the Tesla can do really fast acceleration and uh, braking doesn't cost you anything from an energy standpoint at that point um uh, because you're already at high speed so i absolutely i mean you could argue that the technological improvement even in congestion will accelerate the development of the waves um at super high speed we see less waves just because of the free flow nature so that's less of a concern but mm -hmm. but the what i what i take from there is interesting because think about your center city 
And, you know, uh, in, in Europe, in some cities, if you have a very noisy motorbike at night, you'll be stopped for uh, excessive noise. Um, if there's a save the air day, uh, the speed on the rotational freeway around Paris will have a limit of 40 kilometers an hour to spare the air. Um, and there are plenty of places in Switzerland where if you're a truck, you cannot drive through that neighborhood on Sunday. And so the notion being, I think maybe one way to fight against this uh, in, uh, inevitable uh, technological um, acceleration of these things is by regulation saying, yeah, it's great. You have a fantastic car. But guess what? If you're driving that freeway at that time, you're not. So you're, you're not. It's not legal for that freeway to go 5G. Okay, 5G is more like fighter pilot. But okay, <laughs> one point uh, whatever G. Um, uh, and and I I think ultimately we will see that. I could see uh, as usual. I would say California might be one of the first because you can directly tie it to GHG emissions. So maybe that's a good way to push it uh, on the floor of the assembly or the senate. Um, and to me, that's the aspiration. And maybe the last question I'd like to leave people with is, if you have a Tesla, and if you happened to be driving your Tesla on I-280, where the speed limit is 65, but the social speed is 75, and you um, turn on the autopilot, what will happen? So I'm not giving you the answer. You can try it for yourself if you buy your next Tesla and come here. But it's a real question, right? Because um, will the autopilot pick 65, 75, or something else? And 75 might actually be safer because everybody's, everybody's driving 75. So it's a real question. And uh, that question is not answered today. So uh, yeah. I think there's a lot of room for fun work here. Yeah, just to follow up uh, this uh, comment, and, and I think uh, the. Uh, regardless of the technologies, there would be a trade-off between mobility and that uh, stability. We actually recently did uh, some work uh, uh, analyzing the general trade-off. It's like uh, w whatever the technologies, if you want to keep uh, shorter headways, you would uh, need to uh, you know, accommodate the higher accelerations or oscillations. So, so you know, and, and I saw from your video, uh, Derek's uh, seminal video, that that is great. It's like um, if you want to stable the traffic, you want to create some gap. And that also probably uh, was uh, the reason that that, that uh, some of the lane changes would uh, uh, impact the, 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 uh, the performance. So overall, you know, I just want to uh, like to uh, learn your comment about or your thoughts about this trade-off, fundamental trade-off that we cannot overcome. Um, and also I left another message about, uh, uh, you know, comparing deep learning with the learning uh, with other based other. method, uh, other physics-based methods, but you can, we can skip it if, if other people is asking that question. I try to do both. I have a meeting with my dean at 10, uh, but it's only one step up, so it's fine. I'll, let me try with the first one first. Um, so, I think you point your finger on something crucial is that this method is not going to work with short headways because it's doing exactly the opposite. It's trying to increase the headway to reduce the amount of abrupt acceleration and decelerations, which is again why it's doing something counterintuitive. And so the the here's the fear, but I think it will happen. It's like if enough cars prevent you from short headways, um, it'll be much better for traffic but it'll be very annoying to people. Uh, and you can see road rage going up uh, with that. And 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 so um, the analogy for that is, imagine the first time a guy saw a traffic light 80 years ago at an intersection in their little town, show up with their car, see a red traffic light, and has to stop when there's clearly nobody at the intersection because it's 80 years ago, the person would have been super frustrated or say that stuff is stupid. But OK, now traffic lights, we in most countries, when they're red, we don't drive through. Um, and so it's kind of become socially acceptable. And so I think there is a learning curve where long headways uh, have to become socially acceptable because recognized for the common good. And that's, you know, that, that's we're not our society has not progressed there yet. Um, but it's not crazy that it will. I mean, think about social distancing. I mean. <laughs> We've learned to maintain distances, so it's a form of uh, social distancing on the freeway. Um, the, specific to the question of uh, learning, um, so the, the the view I gave were a bit provocative and radical on purpose. The truth is, um, 
the best way, in my opinion, is to combine model-based approaches and learning. So here's a classical case. Say you do optimal control that requires some kind of forecast. Um, you can do better optimally than if you just do feedback because you have more information. You have information about the future. Uh, and say now you have a database of futures because you have measurements. Technically, you could try to learn an optimal controller by imitation learning uh, and then implement it without the model. So I think um, we're not going to completely um, remove all the model-based approaches and, and throw them in, in the garbage. Um, in general, model-based approaches can be really good to initiate um, uh, learning algorithms too. So think about it as a warm start uh, or um, uh, or expert. Um, uh, and so I think the people who will score highest on this is people who can use both efficiently um, and essentially use the uh, use the learning part to improve what where the human you know has essentially reached this plateau and i know that sounds a bit philosophical but it's something we do it uh, we do it a lot because um it does save a lot of computational power thank you so much i really enjoyed it thank you alex um you know the students are very fascinated about the experiments that you them you showed uh to demonstrate the method and there's one question is about the experiment Ask, uh, have you put any science for those um, automated vehicles in your field tests? And do the human beings can recognize these vehicles as special? Um, thank you for that question. And that'll be my last answer because I really have to go at 10. But um, the answer is absolutely not. And the reason is, um, uh, first, we don't, want to be, we don't want to be shot at. <laughs> uh, but OK, more uh, seriously, um, the perception that something is happening will alter human behavior. If you know that you're slowing down, your tendency to overcome will be higher. So the idea is like people should not even realize this is happening. Uh, now, we do mark our vehicles. They have an X on the roof because uh, we're flying drones to monitor what we're doing, but people can see it. Uh, maybe people with very high vehicles like trucks can see the Xs, but other people can not see it. So the answer is most of the people of the highway don't even know we're doing this. And that's by design because that's the way it should be. It's like you want to operate in conditions where people are behaving normally. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you again for the insight for presentation. <laughs> it's, it's really great to see uh, um, um, you all here. Uh, Fred, it's been a while. You also, thank you. And uh, keep it up in the pandemics. Thank you again for the invitation. And uh, hopefully one day we'll see each other in the physical world. Okay. Yes. Hope to see you. Thanks. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. 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 Bye, everybody. Bye-bye.